Okay, welcome to the School of Education Doctoral Student Colloquium Series presentation. My name is Dr. Sheila Vaidya, and I'm going to be the faculty moderator for today's colloquium. We are so pleased to welcome all of our virtual attendees, including School of Education faculty, staff, students, the university and community members, and members from our partner association, among others. The doctoral student colloquium series offers the School of Education students an opportunity to share their original research and learn from their peers and members of the academic community. Each month, one EDD and one PhD student presents their research at the colloquium, which is typically offered both on campus at Drexel University and online through Zoom. However, due to the COVID global pandemic, all colloquium events as per university requirements are offered virtually through Zoom. These sessions help doctoral students to connect with each other and develop a peer community that is invaluable and, they, and helps them to learn the process of academic communication. Each doctoral student presenter is also asked to write a research brief that relates to his or her presentation, which is then included in an edited publication titled Doctoral Student Research Briefs, which is published on the School of Education website. The research brief is a way to disseminate our doctoral students' research in a concise format and provides them with publishing experience. Each presenter will be provided 20 minutes to share his or her research. We will then move on to questions and answers following each presentation. Uh, please save your questions at the end or chat or type them in the chat area of your Zoom, or you may use your mic at the end of the presentation. But there are only about 10 minutes provided for questions. So if you have additional questions, you could type them in the chat or email them to the person, to the presenter. So our first speaker is Tajma Cameron, who is a PhD student in the School of Education. So I'll say a brief things about, uh, briefly introduce her background. Dajma Cameron is a native of Brooklyn, New York. She's a second year PhD student in the School of Education at Drexel. And she's pursuing her degree in education leadership and policy. Prior to arriving at Drexel, Dajma earned a BS in biology from Temple University an MS in biotechnology studies, and an MAT with a biology certification from University of Maryland Global Studies. Tajma is a, is a certified biology high school teacher, and she's certified in Maryland and Pennsylvania, and she worked as a science and math teacher in high school. Her research focuses on how culturally affirming, sustaining, and creative instructional practices and curriculum can be utilized to cultivate and nurture Black girls' STEM identity in formal school settings and informal STEM environments. The title of her presentation is, We Are STEM, Black Girls' Perception of Engaging in an Informal Culturally Sustaining STEM enrichment program and its influence on the development of their STEM identity. Um, so Tajma, you may begin 20 minutes for your presentation. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Vadia, and good afternoon, everyone. I am going to first share my screen. Can everyone see my slide? Okay, perfect. 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time um, to be here as I discuss my proposed pilot study titled, We Are STEM, Black Girls' Perspectives on Engaging in an Informal, Culturally Sustaining STEM Enrichment Program and its Influence on Their STEM Identity. Uh, so today's presentation will include a brief description of who I am, as well as an explanation of the study design and considerations for future work. Um, this proposed study represents my developing understanding of this area of research. And as such, I welcome any feedback and or suggestions. Um, before beginning my presentation, I would like to um, review some key terminologies that will be used throughout the study. Um, in this pilot study, Black is used to refer to all Black people of African descent. Um, the term informal is used to describe experiences in learning spaces that occur outside of the school. Um, culturally sustaining, I'm referring to culturally sustaining pedagogy that promotes cultural pluralism and where the rich cultural heritage of participants is both valued and maintained. And STEM enrichment programs, um, as Marola and Sherp, 2013 note, these are designed to improve student outcomes in STEM fields, with many of them being targeted to improve outcomes for traditionally underrepresented minority groups, females and or economically disadvantaged students. And the uh, definition of STEM identity that is being utilized as the study is actually from Kim et al. And it's being viewed from a social identity perspective, where STEM identity is a type of social identity um, that's concerning the extent to which individuals identify as members of a specific STEM field. So for example, physics majors, physicists, and also how you see yourself and others in terms of specific prototypes of the STEM field. So who am I, briefly? Um, I identify as a Black woman, a critical scholar, a STEM educator, and a researcher that has navigated the K through 20 education system in the United States. Um, and I've gained substantive experience, both educating students in STEM and as well as um, being educated in STEM. So the background and rationale for this proposed pilot study, uh, despite black females demonstrating their STEM interests and aptitudes, this affinity towards STEM is not being translated into representation within STEM fields. Um, the literature suggests that a critical factor influencing black girls pursuance and persistence in STEM fields is the development of their STEM identities within formal and informal STEM environments. Informal culturally sustaining STEM environments has shown to provide um, black girls with a space where their STEM identities can be cultivated and nurtured and where they can actually create counter narratives to that negative and deficit thinking surrounding black girls as STEM learners. And as King and Pringle 2019 posit, listening to these experiences of black girls and observing them in informal STEM learning context, this can provide critical significant insights on how to effectively engage black girls in STEM, as well as fostering their sustained interest and participation in STEM careers. This leads to my research problem. Um, existing literature has often held on to these reproduced misconceptions and false notions uh, that the lack of representation of black students in STEM fields is due to one, their own disengagement, as well as a lack of competence in STEM. Um, however, the exclusion of culturally sustaining STEM settings throughout the P through 20 education community has actually contributed to the underrepresentation of Black female students, as often their experiences in STEM has not been focused on effective ways to cultivate and nurture their identities. And this leads to the purpose of my study, which is to examine exper their experiences, their perspectives on engaging in an informal culturally sustaining STEM enrichment program and how that participation influences the development of their STEM identity. Uh, this study presents uh, here, and I'm just gonna talk about a brief literature discussion. The literature review being presented here, it provides a laser focus on key studies related to my area of research. So first, the importance of STEM identity. Um, scholars contend that developing a strong STEM identity can be a critical factor that helps underrepresented students or groups pursue and persist in a STEM career. Um, in fact, also that 
STEM identity provides a theoretical lens uh, to better comprehend the mechanisms by which individual STEM experiences impact not only their STEM career choices, choices but as well as their persistence in STEM field. Um, also in looking at factors that lead to underrepresentation, uh, the literature suggests a critical issue affecting black girls engagement in STEM pathways are racial and gender biases. Uh, the term intersectionality refers to the meaning and consequences of multiple categories of group membership. And it's been found and research indicates that black girls face stereotypes before even entering a school building, which negatively impacts their self-esteem and self-perceptions. These stereotypes are related to their race, their gender and class. Um, lastly, looking at the need for positive STEM um, spaces, STEM learning spaces, scholars stress the critical importance of providing Black girls with opportunities to have an academic and social space where they can counteract these deficit notions, shape their identities as producers, innovators, and disruptors in STEM. And these learning spaces will allow their ideas to be validated. Uh, this study presents two frameworks as a lens to examine Black girls' perspectives on engaging in an informal, culturally sustaining STEM enrichment program. Um, the framework of critical race feminism will be useful to explore that intersectionality that I spoke about earlier um, with, of participants, their race, their gender, and class, as critical race feminism focuses on individuals uh, that has been faced with multiple forms of discrimination based on race, gender, and class. Um, the second framework, Yasso's cultural wealth model, examines six forms of cultural capital that students of color experience. But for the purpose of this study, I will be focusing on social, navigational, and aspirational capital. I'm here, this figure represents a conceptual framework that I developed based on my interpretations of factors that impact Black girls' STEM identity. And this is based on the literature. Um, as you can see, we have critical race feminism, the teacher influence, as well as what factors um, go into building Black girls' STEM identity. To address my research questions, so looking at the research design, um, I will utilize a qualitative case study design. Um, and a qualitative research approach was chosen for this study because qualitative research methods, as cited in the literature, are valuable in providing rich descriptions of a complex phenomena. Specifically, the case study method will be used to gain a holistic and in-depth view of my research problem. Um, I have two research questions that will be used um, to guide my study. The first being, how do informal culturally sustaining STEM enrichment programs foster the formation of Black adolescent girls' STEM identities? And the second question is, how do Black adolescent girls navigate their multiple identities, example, uh, racial identity, gender identity, and STEM identity, while participating in an informal culturally sustaining STEM enrichment program. Um, in thinking about participants for the study, they will be selected purposefully based on their enrollment in the informal culturally sustaining STEM enrichment program. Um, and I would hope to have at least eight participants who are rising third graders and are students at public and charter schools throughout the Northeastern city where the informal culturally sustaining STEM enrichment program is located. Um, the area of the Northeastern city is chosen because of my location um, where I am currently pursuing my degree. Uh, for this study, rising third graders were chosen due to research, which indicates by Collins et al. 2020, that gaps in positive STEM experiences and practicing practices begin as early as elementary school. So I'm interested in looking at participants earlier on in their academic career. Um, not sure if they'll have already had experience in STEM enrichment programs. So that's something that I'm still looking into. So in thinking about the data collection procedures, what I'll be using the data collection tools um, to address my research questions, I'm looking at video observations as well as self-expressive artifacts and semi-structured interviews. 
And these self-expressive artifacts that I'm referring to, um, I would like for participants to create um, self-expressive artifacts that represent how they view themselves as STEM learners um, within the context of the STEM environment. Um, they may create narratives, dances, uh, paintings, PowerPoints, poetry, raps, or basically any other medium that they choose to express themselves. Um, and during these semi-structured interviews, particip participants will be asked to share their artifacts and what it means to them and why they decided to express them, their experiences in that art form. So in looking at thinking about the significance of this study, uh, STEM identity has a significant impact on STEM achievement and persistence in STEM pathways. Um, to pursue advanced STEM degrees and to enter the STEM workforce, a student's STEM identity is, is significant. And the way they view themselves based on their beliefs and their STEM abilities will actually directly impact their pursuance and their persistence. And this is even more significant for underrepresented students. Um, when thinking about future research and how that connects to that, I think that connecting Black students' um, formal and informal STEM experiences uh, to the real world is one way in which Black students' STEM interests and talent development can be nurtured. I think that's essential to fostering the formation of their identity. So while I'm in this pilot study, I'm looking at these informal experiences, I would be interested in seeing how their participation in informal culturally sustaining STEM environments, how that translates back into the actual classroom, meaning are they pursuing STEM outside of the classroom? Are they going to museums? Are they engaging in practices that, uh, that actually allow them to persist? So here are my references and Thank you, particularly to my sisters in scholarship for helping me go through this um, presentation. And thank you to Dr. Flowers for his support. I welcome any questions and feedback. Thank you, Tajma. That, was, uh, that is an important study and it's nice to see its development. And we look forward to the findings which would have broader implications in more than one way. Thank you. So this is the time for questions since Lajma also finished her presentation a few minutes before time. Uh, we have extra time for questions. So we have about 13 minutes left <laughs> for questions. So please ask if you have questions. I have a question actually. Yes. Uh, yes. So Lajma, I, I'm almost certain I, I heard you say that this was like a pilot study. And so I'm wondering, in relation to your dissertation and the way in which you're planning to position yourself as a scholar moving forward, how would you connect this pilot study to your future work? Hmm. That's a great question. Thank you, Nisha. Um, thinking about my dissertation, it, it, I would say it changed weekly, but I'd say now I'm really interested in counter spaces and how these STEM enrichment programs or these STEM environments, how they serve as counter spaces for Black girls to counter these deficit notions, to build their knowledge as STEM learners. So I would say that counter spaces will be my focus. So the actual learning environment, that's how it, and that's, that's where I am right now with my dissertation research. Thank you. Thank you, I look forward to seeing that develop. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Comments or questions one more time? Okay. Oh, there's some comments for you, Tajma, in the chat, but I don't see any questions. All right. Well, thank you for your comments. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then we can, if there are no further questions, then we can move to our second presenter, who is whose name is Adam Jones, who is a student in our EDD program. And he is specializing in global international education. So um, Adam Jones is currently the director of China programs and special initiatives for China education. Uh, he actually is um, based in Washington, DC. 
Um, after growing up in Arkansas, a little bit about his background. After growing up in Arkansas, Adam moved to China, where he spent more than 11 years living, studying, and working mostly in Dalian and Beijing. He served as an on-site director for the China Education Program in Beijing, and in uh, 2015 and, and 16 moved back to China. 2015 to 16 moved back to China as a consultant on the Schwarzman Scholars Program at Tsinghua University. He completed a master's at University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana in East Asian Studies and is currently finishing up his PhD in educational leadership at Drexel University. His research interests are related to Chinese higher education and particularly US-China educational collaborations. So the title of Adam's presentation is Challenges Facing US-China Educational Programs, a Case Study. I'd like, like you to begin, Adam. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. And um, thanks everybody. I'm, I appreciate the opportunity here to share a little bit about uh, my research. First, let me see if I can share my screen successfully. Okay, can you all see that? Are you good? Okay. Yes. Great. Um, well, uh, so uh, as I said, um, Dr. Vadi, I said um, uh, my um, research here, this uh, it, is the title of my presentation is Challenges Facing U.S.-China Education Programs, a Case Study. Um, and this is related to the dissertation that I've been working on for uh, quite a while now. Um, and um, so I'm going to uh, jump right in, jump right in um, and with that. Um, so first of all, obviously, you know, it's a very critical time in U.S.-China relations right now. Um, and from my perspective, I think there's a really important role for these kinds of programs. Um, I think it's hard to overestimate the importance of China to the picture of global higher education. Um, you know, right now, Chinese students make up about 30% of international students in the U.S. And going back to 2014, there, were, there have been around 300,000 Chinese students um, studying, you know, in U.S. universities. Um, and of course, in the last, you know, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of foreign universities, a lot of U.S. universities looking to build programs in China um, during this, this period. Um, so what, I'm, what I've done my, in my dissertation, a qualitative multi-site case study, looking at three specific U.S.-China educational collaborative programs in China. Um, now, the problem, you know, uh, that I'm, I'm looking at here is there's been really limited research into the criteria and sort of the critical factors for su the success of these programs. Um, so, you know, the purpose is hopefully this, this research will help administrators think a bit more critically um, about how to build programs that are going to benefit universities, benefit students, faculty and staff, as well as the broader cause of uh, U.S.-China relations. Um, you know, there's, there's a prominent scholar who noted that there is a, a real asymmetry, a, a fearful asymmetry, he calls it, uh, between what the average Chinese citizen knows about the United States and what the average American knows about China. And so I think these programs can play a role in helping educate a more informed and, and enlightened populace in the United States who have a better understanding of this really challenging and complex relationship. Um, so uh, let me, first of all, explain sort of who the heck I'm talking about here. Um, first in more general terms, and then I'll get into some more specifics later. Um, so I looked at US-China educational collaborations. These are ed joint educational programs developed between US and Chinese universities established between 1990 and 2015. And these programs, these three programs I looked at all have six things in common. So again, it's a number one, it's a collaboration between a US and a Chinese university. Number two, these programs are based in China on Chinese university campuses. Number three, the academics, the academic management, the curriculum, et cetera, is provided almost exclusively by the US university partner here. And thus the language of instruction is, is English in all of these programs. 
The faculty are mostly international. However, one of the program has slightly less than that, about 40% of the faculty being international. And the student bodies in these programs, for two of the programs, they're predominantly, almost exclu exclusively Chinese. Um, but for the other, it's, um, they have 60% uh, Chinese students and 40% um, international students. And so here are the research questions that really framed um, kind of my dissertation. And, and for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be focusing on the second one there. And that's how were these US-Chinese university collaborations structured originally? How those structures shifted over time? And how do they face um, challenges um, in, in running these programs? Um, here's um, the literature review um, that, that forms the foundation for this study. And I won't go into too much detail of this, but I, you know, I had three research streams you know, looking at the internationalization of higher education in China. So I really looked at um, the development and the, and the sort of massification of Chinese higher education that really took dates from the late 1980s up until today. Um, I also then took a look at US um, higher education institutions establishing operations in China. Again, we started to see this, a lot of, of programs, a lot of foreign universities looking to establish these um, in the 90s, early 2000s, and then again, navigating changes and challenges. Um, so just a, a couple of things on the study design. As I said, this is a multi-site case study, um, and it primarily employed one-on-one uh, -on -one semi-structured interviews conducted between uh, October and December of 2021. Um, I, of course, had hoped to be able to conduct uh, a lot of these interviews on-site um, and do on-site observations and get up close uh, with these programs and, and see how they operate and, and meet with students and faculty and administrators in person. Uh, alas, uh, COVID-19 and travel restrictions didn't allow that to happen. So the primary data collection method was the interviews and artifact collection. I employed um, coding techniques like structural and in vivo coding um, in the data analysis project. Um, now the, the population, so um, I, I interviewed 15, um, uh, 15 people, six administrators, six faculty and three students from these programs. You can see some of the positions of the um, administrators there. Uh, so like Dean of the Institute, um, the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Dean of Undergraduate Studies in some of these programs. Now, um, there's a few way to think about these programs. Um, Laughlin in a, in a publication uh, from IIE sort of Broke, broke these kinds of programs into five types, like study abroad, joint degree, research partnerships, branch campuses, um, conferring institutions. But um, and my, my assessment of that, it's a little bit vague and kind of a lot of these categories are overlapping. So um, I broke this down into two main categories of programs. And I really um, um, took a page sort of from Chinese um, legal, how these are represented in, in Chinese law. And so these programs are either Chinese foreign cooperative educational institutions or Chinese foreign cooperative educational programs. Um, and the difference here is that um, in a CEI, an institution, this is where a foreign and a Chinese university work together to create a separate independent university. Um, these are often called joint venture universities um, of which there's about nine of them currently in China. Um, some of the ones that are more well known are, for example, the University of Nottingham in Ningbo. There's um, the University of Liverpool and Xi'an Jiao Tong. You may have heard of NYU Shanghai as another prominent one of these, um, or Duke Kunshan. These are all examples of, of these CEIs. And the important thing to remember about these is they, these programs usually have what's called legal person status, meaning that they are able to enter into contractual arrangements. They sponsor visas. They can hire you know, faculty and staff directly under their own auspices. So they are a legally recognized entity under the Chinese Ministry of Education. Um, now, the more common form, and, and one that requires much less time and effort and investment to set up, is the CEP. Um, and that's the, the, the Chinese Foreign Cooperative Educational Program. And in this arrangement, a Chinese and a US university, or a foreign university, um, create a program on a Chinese university campus. And in this arrangement, the Chinese university is the only legally recognized entity in China, meaning that the Chinese university is the one that hires the instructors, the faculty, the staff, issues visas, sponsors uh, uh, international faculty visas and things like that. 
So a CEP is to say cannot hire faculty and staff directly. Okay. Um, so here's a little overview of the three programs that I looked at, some of the details about them, and I, and I won't go into too much detail here, but I'll just say, like, as I, as I mentioned, program, I, I have programs A, B, and C. A and C are these CEPs, right, these more limited sort of uh, partnerships. Program B is a CEI, a joint venture university. And all of these programs, they're all dual degree, double degree. So students get a degree from the US university when they finish and also the Chinese university. The one slight difference here is in program B, they get a, a degree from the created joint venture university from program B itself. Um, so I'll go through some of the findings here and I'm gonna use data in the form of participant quotes to highlight some of the key points that I wanna want to um, make, make note of here. Um, and first of all, you know, I organized um, the data into different themes and sub themes. For the purposes of this presentation, I'll be focusing more on sort of that middle navigating different systems. Um, and I should mention here that the emphasis that I added in these quotes, that's that the parts that are bolded, that's what I did in order to highlight certain ideas I want to bring forth here. Um, so, so for most of these programs, and this is supported in the research you know, by Philip Altback and Jane Knight, um, revenue was certainly one of the factors that motivated the establishment of these programs. Um, but also, and again, this also aligns with research from Jane Knight, especially university prestige was another sort of motivating factor behind the establishment of these programs. But there was also, you know, an altruistic sense, as you can see, and this is one of the quotes from an administrator who says, you know, it's, it was also about sort of building bridges and cultural understanding and that, um, they were looking to provide opportunities for Chinese students who might not have done very well on, on their college entrance examinations, the Gaokao, and, and wanted other kinds of higher educational opportunities. Um, you know, the management of these partnerships is really key and in figuring out how to navigate these sometimes often opaque uh, bureaucratic systems in China is one of the sort of enduring challenges. So um, this is a quote from an administrator of Program A. Um, and he started this, they, they started this program more than 20 years ago. And so the program is still around, but he talks about you know, the importance of making your partner look good. You know? And he credits the long-term success of this program with the decision early on in negotiations with the Chinese university partner, where he said, you know what, let's just go 50-50 on all revenue. Um, let's make, make, it, make sure it's a, a full partnership that way. And he credits that for the part of the long-term success of, the, of this program. Um, so, you know, here's an example, getting into sort of the academics and sort of the accreditation part of it. Here's an example of something that's a specific, a challenge specifically to program B. Again, this CEI, this Joint Venture University, which is different from the other two programs, what programs A and C face. Um, so in program B, because their Chinese university partner is quite removed from the actual academic governance of the program, um, that means the program B administrators are the ones that have to figure out how to get the curriculum and everything approved by the Chinese Ministry of Education. And then of course, this can be enormously challenging. For programs A and C, because they don't really exist in a sense under Chinese law, they can simply rely on their Chinese university partners to get the curriculum and approved. And of course, their Chinese university partners already have very long, well-developed relationships with education officials in China by virtue of the fact that you know, they're a university in China, right? Um, so here, you know, a program B administrator is talking about that challenge. Um, but you know, what it comes down to is you have these two very different systems kind of coming together. Um, and in, in the second quote there, um, you know, I won't read that, but you can read that if you like that. Um, the program B administrator is talking about how uh, they have to present their curriculum to the Chinese Ministry of Education. But program B has this very complicated, interdisciplinary, integrated curriculum. And it doesn't really fit neatly into the categories that are mandated by the Chinese Ministry of Education. So they're sort of shoehorning it in there, you know, driving a, a square peg into a round hole. It almost feels like they're creating a fiction to tell the Ministry of Education in order to get that, um, to get that done. But again, this is not a problem that programs A or C face. Um, 
you know, another facet, which I think is, is really interesting um, and that, that a lot of the administrators that I, I interviewed spoke about is this sense of sort of encroachment um, onto the, the educational mission of, of these programs. Um, and so it, one of the things is like student military training and ideological training. Now, people who've spent time in China, you know, um, all Chinese university freshmen are required to do military training. And this is two to three weeks, usually at the beginning of their freshman term, where they sort of put on some fatigues, learn how to march, and, and, and that's about it. And in the old days, it used to be a little bit more sort of physical fitness oriented. Um, it's begun to take on a little bit of a different hue today, again, according to some of the, the administrators I talked to. Um, and there's an increasing number of sort of ideological classes. So here we're talking about Xi Jinping thought, um, you know, Marxist theory, some other stuff like that. Um, and it's become a much more serious element to the university education. And, and one of the administrators bemoaned that it was becoming difficult to incorporate all of the training and these special ideological classes into the curriculum. It's gotten to the point where there's almost a full extra semester's worth of content there that has to be sort of wedged in to the curriculum. Um, you know, faculty hiring and management. And again, here the, the dynamics are different for each of these different programs. And I won't go into all of the details here, um, but it comes down to sort of a real question about sort of ultimate authority or control over these programs. Um, you know, programs A and C have to rely on their Chinese university to hire their faculty members. So hiring and paying their faculty members, sponsoring their visas if they happen to be foreigners, right? Um, so it kind of comes down to a question of who's sort of in control um, in, in these situations. You can't simply, uh, you know, fire a faculty member uh, that easily. It has to go through the Chinese, you know, educational bureaucracy. And then there's a question too about sort of tenure. You know, how do you attract and keep really talented academics, you know, on these programs when tenure doesn't really exist um, in China in the same way that we think of it here? Um, and so these are all unresolved, you know, questions about how do you manage these? And there's been a couple of different like lawsuits involving some, you know, an international or an American hired on one of these programs trying to sue the US university back in the United States and the US university in the States saying, no, 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 you don't work for us, you work for the Chinese university. Um, so that's kind of a, a sticky, uh, thorny question here. Um, and, you know, program B again thought they would have they would establish this program and then they would have something like 25 or 30 percent of the courses would be taught by these faculty members from the U.S. University coming over and spending a semester or two and then flying kind of back and forth but very quickly learned that that was just not sustainable not practicable so this kind of gets a little bit into how some of these programs have changed how that or original formulation excuse me has had to change a little bit um so, you know, basically all of the faculty and ministries that I talked to discussed this, this question about academic freedom um, and, 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 and sort of the, the geopolitical sort of ramifications around this. And all of them reference, you know, really significant challenges and increasingly so in, with these issues. Um, this was something, and, and a lot of them noted who had long experience in China, that this wasn't an issue really five, 10 years ago. Um, but there, there often is nervousness, particularly among faculty members, about talking about potentially sensitive, politically sensitive issues in the classroom. Um, and there was a basic consensus from all of them that, again, there was increasing attention to the, the content of what is being taught in these programs. And I, I, you know, I picked up on this really sort of palpable fear um, of, that administrators and faculty had that something might end up on Chinese social media, some clip from a class or some quote or something like that. Um, that might cause specific um, problems for the Chinese university or for the program itself. So um, a, a lot of the faculty members and administrators were quite, quite nervous and conservative about, about these issues. Um, and I won't get into COVID-19 here, but obviously I'll just suffice it to say that like everywhere else and every other educational institution out there, COVID-19 has had really dramatic impacts on these programs and still is, as those of you who are watching the news and seeing the lockdowns that are happening in China right now, it's a, it is a, it's a challenge and it, 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 we don't know uh, how much longer it's going to kind of go on. You know, a program like Program A can't get any of their international faculty back. So they've got their students in the classroom with their faculty zooming in from all over the world. Program B 
they've got their faculty back, but they can't get their international students back. So they've got some students in the classroom and they've got other students zooming in from all over. So obviously this changes these programs in a pretty fundamental way. Um, so moving um, just to results and in interpretations here, um, my, my chapters four and five. Um, you know, uh, result one, I mean, uh, I talked about this, how these different program structures um, that these US-China educational collaborations uh, employ, you know, they really mandate or necessitate different kinds of strategic approaches in, in tackling some of these challenges. Um, you know, these programs result too, I mean, these programs can, I think can have really positive benefits for students and institutions, um, as well as for, you know, Chinese relations with the West more broadly. But there are, you know, sticking points and tension points around values around higher education and, um, specifically here. Um, and in result three, you know, navigating, you know, navigating these different educational regulatory systems and trying to avoid pitfalls, it really requires expertise and maybe most importantly, flexibility. And those of you who have spent time, you know, working in um, Chinese higher ed, you know, but the, the value and importance of patience and flexibility there. But program administrators, you know, you, you've, in order to be successful, you've got to find a way to adapt to an environment where there's, you know, control is sort of this vexing uh, question, you know, ultimate kind of control. And you kind of have to make your peace with that and in order to be able to, to run a program successfully long-term. And I'd say the last sort of result from, from this study that I found was really, you know, COVID-19 and the resulting actions from that, as well as sort of the negative trajectory of relations between China and, and the West, China, specifically the United States, it really represents a significant, if not existential threat to these programs. And what is the future of these programs going forward? I think that's a really big question. Um, and uh, so uh, moving on, my uh, last sort of slide here, just um, uh, conclusions and, and, and recommendations here. And so, um, you know, I think in the beginning stages of developing these programs, there has to be a really clear set of objectives and goals what is to be achieved and, and a good understanding of what it's going to take to kind of get there. Um, and, you know, finding a, a partner university, um, in a Chinese partner university who's in alignment with those goals is incredibly important. Um, that's something, you know, that in days past, you know, where maybe it was much easier to sort of establish these programs and any Chinese university would jump at the chance to, to work with almost any foreign university those days are, are, are kind of gone. Um, so it's really important to, you know, find a strong partner and really work to see things from their perspective and understand the constraints that they're working under. I think it's very important. Um, and again, administrators need to kind of go into these programs and keep that larger picture and framework um, in mind. Um, and again, as I said, like for those of you who, who spent time working in China, you know, flexibility is not just a good attribute to have, it's pretty much required. Um, so I, I think we're administrators and faculty should really use the tools also that have been developed during you know, the COVID-19 pandemic to look at how they're engaging with students and see how they can enhance engagement between students on the Chinese uh, university campus and also the U.S. university campus and build more collaborative interactions between not just students, but also faculty um, kind of going back and forth. I think that's a, that would be a good uh, thing that people should work on. Um, so yeah, um, I think I'm at time or almost there. So I'll leave it there. Here are my, my references. And um, yeah, I'm excited to, happy to answer any questions or um, hear your comments. Again, I'm hoping to turn some of this into an article or two here down the line. So yeah. I'm happy to, to hear from you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. That was that is really um, interesting from the standpoint of getting a perspective on education and a broader perspective. Um, so I just wanted to open up and see if there are any questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are there any questions for Adam on what on his presentation? Uh, I have a question, um, Adam, and the question is, um, I was in, interested to note that the faculty who come from, um, from the US, that they, you mentioned that they come in and they teach for a month or so 
So they don't complete the course. Well, that was for one of the programs, program B had this okay. idea and they have their structure. So they have seven week terms. So they sort of have many quarters or so, you know, and, and so they would have they would have faculty. They thought this would work well to have a faculty member come in and teach seven weeks and then go home and kind of, you know, right. have this revolving door of faculty, but they learned pretty quickly that that wasn't realistic and, and it was just that's hard right. to yes. people to come in and be there first period of time and go back. And so that's when they decided to do, no, no, no we need to hire more, you know, permanent, you know, faculty that, that are based right. here in China. I was just thinking about the course continuity, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the content, what happens to that? Because so, so I think, like you said, in the beginning, you have to be, have very clear goals so that you know, how to plan for those goals that you want to achieve through a, any specific program. Right, yeah. right. Oh, I see Dr. Clothy. Dr. Clothy, do you have any questions? This I is do have a your question. area of work. <laughs> yes, but actually I want, uh, I, my question is sort of expanding it. Um, Adam, I know that you're an expert on China and I think your presentation clearly reflected that. Do you have any um, perception of whether um, some of these issues that are relevant to China specifically are also relevant to other partnerships that universities in the US might be wanting to undertake with other countries. I mean, NYU, just as an example, has NYU Shanghai, but they also have NYU Abu Dhabi and God knows where else because they have expanded quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and branch campuses are a very, very, very popular form of internationalization of mm -hmm. higher ed. So mm -hmm. what can we say, what can we take from your study that might be applicable elsewhere, if you happen to know? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And unfortunately, the answer is probably no. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't have as much knowledge about you know, outside of China um, and how the kind of these programs and you know, NYU is a great example. NYU Abu Dhabi, Texas A&M has uh, branch campuses, and I know that a lot of the administrators that work on some of these programs, and even in China, have had experience, you know, doing um, in some of these other international branch campuses elsewhere. Um, and and I, I think there are some similarities, certainly. You know, I you know the, the need to have you know deep knowledge and understanding. A sort of, and in, in, in we say connections here, but to be well established in kind of educational bureaucracies in the country where you're operating, obviously, is an important thing that probably carries is going to be the you know similar in a lot of these situations. I think for China, it's maybe a, a bit more serious just because of the nature of how things have developed and how rapidly things have 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 um, expanded. You know, in, in, in uh, the pace of development in China. So I think there are some things that, you know, there are some, certainly some similarities. I think that you probably could make some comparisons to how this might work in, you know, Abu Dhabi or some of these other places, but um, mm -hmm. there are some that are kind of maybe more unique to the Chinese situation there. Yeah. And, and do you think that American universities uh, learn and get a broader experience of education? Is that the goal? Yeah, for, for these, you know, so, for the students, you know, who, who like the Chinese students, example, like programs A and C are 99% Chinese students. Mm -hmm. And so for these students, their goal is to get a you know, Western style education taught in English by mm -hmm. often mostly international faculty, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something they wouldn't be able to get, you know, if they just got into a, you know, random Chinese university. So there's right. a, yeah. there is a, you know, a, a real motivation for them to do these kinds of programs. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a big question is, as you know, US-China relations continue to deteriorate, mm -hmm. um, there might be less of an appetite for that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, mm -hmm. China, and opportunities in China and other countries mm -hmm. too are growing rapidly. So it, it's conceivable that, that um, they wouldn't be you know, uh, something that the Chinese students. So that's a motivation I think for the US universities is you know, this helps internationalization efforts on campus. It also hopefully gives them, you know, an avenue into getting Chinese students onto their campus. So the program I mentioned that had been around for 20 years, Program A, you know, they typically every semester going back, you know, really to 2001 or so, they mm -hmm. have anywhere from six to 800 Chinese universities, Chinese students on campus. And mm -hmm. so that's been a real 
you know, good thing for the university itself and for internationalization efforts and for the students as well. So that's one mm -hmm. of the motivations. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we have a few more minutes left if there are any questions on second part from anyone. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Adam. This, is, this has been very interesting. So we thank, I thank our presenters of Tajma Cameron and Adam Jones for presenting today. I thank everyone for attending. All those I hope that you had an interesting experience. It certainly was interesting, the two presentations. And this is the last colloquium for this academic year. So we will see you again in October. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to the presenters and thank you for to the attendees. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.